Poku. Happy 2024. And it went really unbelievably well for a period of time, as is often the case with people who get involved in. If I trade my own account, um, I have a complete understanding of what I'm capable of and I understand what's possible and I can be aggressive or I can be conservative. But with other people's money, you've got to be bloody conservative. I was very goal oriented and financially motivated, but I had to move to a place of being someone who was driven by process. When you buy a company, whether you buy a piece of a company or we're not going to lend money to a company, this company can do something good for the world or bad for the world. The first thing I think uh, is to find companies, uh, banks or whatever that is really committed to change. And in one year, the income of those guys increased around 38%. It's incredible. Well, wow, what a story. Welcome back to the first T-Show episode of the new year. Happy 2024, where it's, it's time, time to trade thoughts. thoughts. Yes, Poku. How you doing? New year, same style. I absolutely yeah. love it. Well, welcome back. We've got some unbelievable guests for you today, but the most important question I want to ask right now is, Poku, happy 2024. How are you doing? Yeah, thanks. Big 2024. You know, we're nearly halfway through the decade. It's, it's just crazy that, you know, we're now here. 2024 is a big year. Um, you know, when it comes to even New Year resolutions as well, I know you're gonna ask me, but for me personally, I personally believe in making change when you notice that you need to make a change. So mm-hmm. that is in June, July, February, whatever. But yeah, no, I mean, yeah, New Year's resolutions this year, you know, it's just more about staying focused, getting to the bag and yeah, just elevating and focusing on my discipline. I love that. How are you? I'm actually quite similar to you. I think New Year's resolutions, I started mine in December actually. Mm-hmm because it's kind of like a little bit of a cheat. Because if I can't do it the whole of December, I feel like I can't bring it into January. That's kind of like a little policy that I have. So, so many people end their New Year's resolutions by February. So that's just a little tactic that I use. But yeah, my goals this year are, you know, more balance and more learning, I think. For me, learning is going to be a big part of this year um, through books, through podcasts, through the incredible guests that we're going to have on this show. I mean, what what do you want from the show in 2024? I mean, 2023 was amazing. Oh, I'd love to know what you want to do in 2024. Yeah, no, we ended 2023 really great, actually. We had John Fury, one of the high profile. Big John yes. Fury. Yes. For that time when he caught you in the face off camera. <laughs> that never happened. No way. <laughs> that happened. Oh, yeah, no. no. <laughs> I don't know. I wouldn't be here to tell the story. No, you've had time for it to heal. It's fine, Logan. Yeah, you yeah. can talk about it. We're an open yeah. show. Yeah, but, you know, with 2024 for the tea show, I just want more prophetic guests, people that I can learn from, people that you can delve into stories because that's that's the trajectory I've seen going in 2023. I like it. We're going to have an incredible 2024. um, And the best way to start off an incredible 2024 is with a great first episode. So who have we got going on today? Yeah, yeah. So starting off, we actually got one of Tickmill's top market strategists, an expert in trading, a professional trader, Patrick Munnerly, who also manages a portfolio of around $20 million. So that's really great. I would love to learn from him and understand the shifts and changes from managing your own money to then managing such a sum, you know, so it'll be great to learn from him. Who else we got? Well, straight after, actually flying in from Brazil, we've got Joao Paulo Pacifico. I've probably butchered that name, but really interesting guest so he's the ceo and the founder of the gaia group and that mainly evolves around now impact investing so we're going to speak a lot about that topic if you don't know what it is well stick around because you're going to learn he's also one of linkedin's top voices with hundreds of thousands of people that follow him on good practices in the workplace how he's created companies where employees actually want to work there and they prosper in all areas of their life so that's another great topic and he's on the board for greenpeace brazil um, I believe that he has many kind of um, donations and kind of charities that help uh, people of Brazil. So it's going to be a truly fascinating conversation. And like with every episode, I know we spoke about news resolutions, but every T show episode should leave you with another resolution to add to your life. Am I right? 100%. Every episode, you can learn something from someone who has very experienced in their field when it comes to trading or even wine tasting. And you can apply that lesson to your own life so it's a win-win situation when you watch these episodes unless in poker's case where the wine tasting is just drinking wine every night right no i'm joking (laughs) 
All right. Anyway, let's let's dive straight into the show, guys. Where it's, it's time to trade thoughts. thoughts with Patrick Munnelly. Sweet. Really. Teach. 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 Yes, guys. It's time to trade thoughts with Patrick Munnelly, with the one and only professional trader, money manager, Titmills market strategist, mentor, and commentator. How are you doing? Very good. Nice to meet you guys. How are you doing? It's great. It's great. The loud uplift here. This is a great <laughs> episode. So how was it coming back to London? from Cold. Very, very cold. And uh, and like we were just saying, quite dark. <laughs> yeah, dull. You know, it's a shame that some people may wake up, they see darkness, go to work, and they're surrounded by walls and come out in this darkness. So. Yeah, yeah. And also spending a lot of time under fluorescent lights doesn't... Uh, doesn't actually add to the mental health situation. <laughs> You're not hanging out this podcast by any chance, are you? <laughs> so where, where is it you're based? I'm based in Mallorca, the south coast, in a town called Cecilinas. Wow. Two minutes from the from the beach. And what was the thought process like when looking to move over there? Um, I just, I've always preferred living in the sunshine. I spent some time living in LA, spent quite a lot of time in America on the west coast when I was younger. Um, and at one point I was thinking about relocating there permanently. Um, but I come from a big family. I'm the eldest of six kids and, um, that comes with its own set of responsibilities. And so the flight time from LA to London versus London to Mallorca is more manageable to deal with, uh, deal with all the family commitments. When it comes to living over there, lots of sunshine and whatnot. What effect would you say that has on your mood when it comes to trading and what? It's um, it's huge. I um, I really think that you know, outside, even just outside of tra- trading, just from a lifestyle perspective, having access to sunlight on a daily basis is really important for for humans. I mean, I you know, originally we lived a lot closer to the equator. That access to sunlight is really important for your mental health and keeping you upbeat and uplifted. And so, you know, the constant grey of, let's say, you know, any country that is on this type type of timeline, um, is it's difficult for people. And you know, like we were saying before, you know, the clocks changing and stuff, and this trending hashtag permatired, you know, it, it impacts people really significantly. I'm really fortunate. The office I trade from in my house is just glass you know it's glass and so i'm permanently getting sunshine and um yeah it makes a big difference big difference i'd love to take you back to i suppose the beginning of trading because we just touched upon it there why why trading how did you get into it from the start what's the story i wasn't involved in the markets um after i graduated from university i uh i joined a an executive search firm in the city and uh worked there for a couple of years learned the ropes and this was just as the dot-com boom was hitting and me and a couple of the guys from there left and we set up our own firm um we were dealing with venture capital firms from the us who were looking to bring operations from the west coast into europe and so obviously london is the first spot for that and we were basically putting in place the guys who were going to run those operations so we had hunting guys out of bigger tech firms to come and start smaller tech firms that would eventually obviously grow um and that uh grew pretty quickly and so at a young age i was able to cash in my my stake in that company and um to one degree or another retired and uh and had a lot of time on my hands and i had friends who were working in the city working at hedge funds because of the the type of work we were doing i was exposed to guys who were you know basically taking equity in companies and overnight flipping it for a lot of money. So the this market mentality appealed to me. And so, like I say, I had some time on my hands, had some uh, chips to play with and, um, and started, I guess, day trading the S&P 500 or more day gambling really at that stage. I didn't have a clue what I was doing. Um, so I started 2004, just you know betting uh basically i'd buy an up market you know if the market opened up i'd, I'd buy it if it opened down i'd sell it and i hit a, a run and um 
and it went really unbelievably well for a period of time as is often the case with people who get involved in in this for, for some reason there is uh there's a beginner's luck syndrome and you you know you you hit a run and you think you're invincible which is what i thought i was and um and then in january 2005 i remember got off a plane in paris checked my black brain tell how long out <laughs> how long ago it is when i first yeah. that and uh I'd been averaging down basically into what was to become a huge losing position. I mean, I lost a six six figure sum that so it was a gut wrenching and sobering experience as an understatement. Yeah. The Blackberry didn't survive the tarmac and uh and yeah, so I, I you know, I lost a lot of money and it had a big impact on me and a big impact on you know, I got divorced through that process and found myself in a position where I knew that it was feasible, people, I knew it was feasible to make money from the markets. I just didn't understand how to do it. And so I networked as I had done as a headhunter and got through contacts, got introduced to um, a guy who became my mentor. He basically, you know, taught me the, the process of trading, but more importantly than that, and something that I couldn't have conceived of at the time, when I first had, well, we, we exchanged emails and then I had a telephone call with him. And um, he asked me about how I, you know, how I got to where I was and I explained and, you know, I told him about the money and stuff. And, um, and he said, are you angry? And I hadn't really thought whether or not, I, I mean, it, you know, it was, it was a meaningful sum of money, but I was fortunate I still had capital, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't broke, but I didn't, I didn't think it through. And I, th and when I thought about it after the call, I thought, yeah, I am really pissed off. You know, this has impacted me badly. And so, um, the next telephone call I had with him, uh, he said, uh, have you thought about the last call? And I was like, yeah, I have. I've really actually thought a lot about what the, you know, what, what, it, what this has actually meant to me losing all this cash. And so he gave me the name of a therapist and. I didn't speak to him again for six months, but I did speak to the therapist and went through a process of like self inventory and, you know, understanding what had driven me to where I was and what I was going to need to do to get to a place where I could come back to this and, and win at it. And, um, and it was a, you know, it was a really meaningful period to change my life. Um, and I got involved in martial arts and, and meditation and just, just totally changed my, you know, the way I was living and then had, he, then he taught me how to actually put in place a process, understand risk management and actually turn the gambling into trading and making consistent money. Well, what, what, what a story, you know, going from having the, you know, beginner's luck to then losing money, to then having to restart all over again, yeah. learn certain things, get a mentor, and then, you know, him having to send you to a therapist and understand. He, did, he, didn't, he didn't send me. He, he went, after we had that conversation, the second conversation, he was like, look, I, if, it, if it has had that type of impact on you, yeah. you're never going to make it in this business because you're going to be coming from a place of revenge. Mm -hmm. And that's really what I would have been doing. And so I'd have actually ultimately gone through all the cash trying to make back what I thought, what I'd lost. When in reality, I had to come back to it for a place of, um, presence and, and perspective and, you know, not thinking or not harboring that thought of, of loss and revenge. You now manage, you know, a portfolio over 20 million. Yeah. So that process definitely seemed to work. Yeah, no, um, yeah, I, um, it, you know, that, that didn't happen overnight. Yeah. You, you know, I'm, it, it all looks great now, but I, you know, when I was 30 and was back at my parents, <laughs> you know, it wasn't so great, but I, there were things I needed to do and things I needed to, to change in my life to get to where I am now. And that was part of that, that process and, and managing other people's money also comes with a different set of responsibilities because I if I trade my own account, um, I have a complete understanding of what I'm capable of and I understand what's possible and I can be aggressive or I can be conservative. But 
with other people's money, you've got to be bloody conservative. Um, you know, people, when I speak to people about in, when they want to, you know, invest money with me uh, or let me manage their money, the, the conversation is always about the upside. Whereas my perspective is, you know, what's your, what can you take on the downside? Because people think, you know, if they can invest a hundred grand, they think they're going to be comfortable with being down 20 or 30 grand. When they actually look at their account and they see it, it's a different story. But if you did have to compare mm -hmm. current you to that original version of you, what would you tell that person? I suppose that person so eager to get into trading, maybe for the wrong reasons. Um, what would you tell them to go away and think about and learn before they started? Self-inventory is the key. Getting comfortable with yourself, understanding, you know, what motivates you, what drives you, understanding what aspects of your personality are going to be counterproductive to what you want to achieve. I, you know, when I started out, I was ill-disciplined. I was, you know, like I said, thought I was invincible um, because I'd had, you know, early success. That comes with its own set of issues. Um, but then there are other people, I guess, who come to the markets from a perspective of need. You know, I mean, the last thing you want to be doing is trading to pay your rent or your mortgage. Just forget it. You Because, you, again, those pressures are not going to allow you to execute a process properly. Because, again, the, the narrative is going to be different in your mind. You're going to be looking at the markets thinking, you know, I need, I need, I come from a place of presence and like I was saying before you know the market is just a data set you're ultimately trading yourself and how you perceive the data whereas once you become I had to move away from being really I was very goal orientated and financially motivated um, but I had to move to a place of being someone who was driven by process and that's a different perspective really different yeah that's very powerful because I like to say that your financial results are derived by the actions. So to be this, you know, million dollar trader, you need to act like a million dollar trader before you become one. Yeah. And, and fake it till you make it. Yeah. <laughs> it's a big part of things. You know, if you if you can manifest mentally where where you want to be and you you stick to a process and you're you're disciplined and you have patience then the, you, you will progress along the journey and ultimately you'll get to your, your, you know, where you want to be. But so many people, you know, come come to this with what they think they're going to make from it mm. as opposed to what you're actually going to do to make it. Talk to me more about your processes, especially as someone that's managing so much money. What would you say your process is for starting a trading day or even the night before, starting from the night before? Um, I, like I say, I meditate daily. Uh, I meditate in the morning and as I was saying before, I meditate if I'm going to trade, if I'm going to actively trade the New York session, I'll meditate before the session opens because that brings me totally present. So like I was saying about thinking of the market as a data set and just your response to that data and executing your process consistently, you have to have that presence. And so that has been a, a you know, big part of my success. Also, like I said, I 15 years ago started doing Wing Chun, um, and again that discipline, patience, presence, game changer. I want to change the tone for a, for a second and speak a little bit about Tick Mill. Yep, because we are here on the T show. We are the sure. T guys ourselves. How have you found working with Tick Mill? From the get go, I found it a rewarding experience I, I hadn't um i hadn't worked with a broker before i'd been approached by numerous brokers over the years um but i had a personal contact who was working at Tickmill at the time and um and she approached me asking would i be prepared to get involved and provide strategy and analysis and i thought for a while about whether or not it was something i I wanted to do but then I at the same time what I realized was that part of my process is is giving back what I've got out of this and so the analysis I provide the groups that I the strategy groups I run is part of me giving back from what I've got out of this this business so 
um, it's it ticked me off for a fantastic platform for me to do that. I love that. And I think when we were doing our research, we even sent some of your recent your recent work, your recent trade results. I mean, it got Pokey very excited. Yeah. <laughs> and I suppose that's part of the strategy and the things that you're teaching through TickMill. What I really try and focus on is transparency. Because like we're saying, you know, this My industry. My word in this industry. Yeah. So, you know, a lot of people um, are only prepared, I guess, to a large degree to, to again, just talk about the upside. Whereas I'm totally transparent, you know, I get stopped out, I lose. But because I'm no longer so goal orientated, I'm process orientated, it's totally irrelevant to me. I'm not trying to prove to people how, you know, how great I am at this. What I'm trying to show them is what's possible. You know, I'm not a signal provider and I'm not spoon feeding people. But what I am prepared to do is offer the pieces to the puzzle for people who want to put in the work and put it together for themselves. Earlier, you said the words um, transparency. Uh, and a question I think we love to ask our guests is about the biggest mistake or the biggest failure they've had. Now, I know you touched earlier upon uh, the six figure loss, which I'm sure ranks high. But I suppose since you've rebuilt those skills and actually learned the proper techniques, are there any experiences again that you've probably taken your biggest learnings from? Because I'm not focused on the outcomes, and what I'm focused on is executing the process. There are periods where I lose, you know, quite a lot of money, but I know that that's just part of the data set. And so I don't, I don't have the same associations, I guess, where um, someone getting involved, you know, starting out, they, they think that the, the outcome of, you know, the next trade is, is the most important thing. And I'm looking way past that. So that's definitely good because it shows that you're just far ahead in your journey in the sense of yeah you don't think of it as oh yeah if this win happens then it makes my day uh, listen don't get me wrong you know when i when i started out it it's that hellish emotional roller coaster of god this better work out yeah. whereas once it's a business and you you come into it from that perspective um it just it just has a different impact you just don't have those same associations and certainly over time you build such a degree of resilience because you know all the scenarios and events that i've traded through i know what i'm capable of i wanted you to also describe yourself in terms of what trade profile you would say so for example swing intraday the way i structure my business is that i have different capital allocated to different time frames so i have structural positions that i take on that you know may run three, six, nine months of a year. And then I have swing trading positions, which maybe two, three days. And then when I want to, I, I trade intraday and, and you know, those trades can last two, three minutes. Yeah. But again, because it's a, a business for me, those are just, those are silos within my business. I don't, it, it, you know, I'm not, I'm not focused on any one at, at, at varying times. Some, you know, like for example, at the moment, structurally, I'm, you know, short the dollar, long gold, I'm long the markets. I know when, when I want to deploy more capital to those positions or when I'm going to deploy more capital to intraday opportunities because of my perception of the volatility in the markets, et cetera. So it, it, it varies. I, I, I don't classify, I, you know, I'm just a trader. I, I, I trade the market. Do you have any like, personal preference to out of those three intraday structural swing you know i've been trading the s p futures market now for you know over 15 years and i have a an affinity with that market and i have a pretty deep understanding of of where opportunities exist there and so that's really probably where my focus is but Again, thinking about it from a business level, I know that there are times when there are opportunities in other markets that I can apply the same process and I'll focus on those that, that, that market at that given time. What I don't do is sit around flipping between charts looking for, you know, a moving average cross <laughs> I'm, You know, I, it's, again, it's the idea of deploying capital in a business sense. So before the episode, we looked at your chart and your performance historically when it comes to trading. And I found it funny that you've outperformed S&P 500 
trading the S and P five hundred, which is interesting. But I wanted to get more into you know your strategy. How would you describe it to someone? If- yeah, so I run a, a strategy group through Facebook for Tickmail. Um, there are two aspects to it. There's the main page, so to speak, where I post a degree of information that is um, would have value to someone who's passively involved in the market. You know, who wants to get a, a sense of where an opportunity is. And that 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 type of, I guess, less involved or less active trader can can use that information and, and benefit from it. And then we have a chat group where it's basically people get to see, I guess, you know, my trading journal almost. Um, so I share my perspective on the markets where I see opportunities developing. I share uh, s- swing trades. Like I said before, it's not a signal service and I'm not spoon feeding people. I'm just showing people what I do and giving them the pieces of the puzzle that if they're prepared to put in the work, they can put it together and make it work for them. And the performance that I share is just simply my day-to-day P&L. It's not, I, again, there are trades that I lose and I, you know, they see that. I, one thing I do do is when I, from time to time, actually share specific entries that I'm going to take, I'm... I also share my stop where I'm going to be wrong and that never changes. And so a lot of times I think with people, um, who show, you know, their, their trade results, you don't see what risk is associated with those results. Mm -hmm. And so you can have fantastic upside, but like I was saying before, in terms of conversations with investors or people who want me to manage their money, um, it's focusing on what the volatility associated with that will be so i share the the stop strategy i have so that people can understand how to professionally manage risk and so i update that through the the trader chat like i say i share trade plans that i'm going to be using for the london and new york sessions and i again through those plans i show people where i'm going to engage in the market and i also show them what i think is achievable if the market moves in a certain direction and where I see a realistic opportunity for profit and and that opportunity, but most specifically, and I have at the top of every trade plan is this is what my stop loss is. When it comes to, you know, setting stop losses and whatnot, do you, would you say you look for more structural areas or is it like a fixed percentage? From my business, it's a, it's, it's a percentage. So, um, like I was saying before, when it, it when it's other people's money, it's it's conservative. So I would I would tend to trade per position zero point two five percent to zero point five percent of an account equity. Whereas the trades I share through the um, strategy group are on my own account, and so I'm a bit more aggressive because, like I said before, I've been doing it a long time and know what I'm capable of. Um, so I'll risk 1%, 2% per position, depending upon what the market's doing and how in sync I feel with, with the market action. So that outperformance of the S&P 500. Yeah, I've actually an interesting question. So, you know, online, me and Gabriel, we talk a lot about for the passive person that works a job, you know, your best bet is going along with the S&P. Yeah, I mean, just invest in the SPY, the ETF. Yeah. You know, just allocate a certain amount of your money and get involved, you know, because unless the human race is going to change dramatically over a long period of time, if you, it just compounds yeah. and, you know, compounding is one of the more, you know, probably one of the miracles of life, not just compounding in terms of trading, but compounding knowledge, um, compounding commitment, you know, compounding is a, is a, is a fantastic tool. And, uh, and certainly if you, you know, if you haven't got time to, to be actively engaged in the market, then yeah, just, just invest. As someone that has actively beaten the market, would you say you bother, um, you know, investing a portion of your wealth into the S and P or is it 90% of my net worth is tied up in my trading account? One final question that we'd like to ask every guest is about the future. 
I know you mentioned about maybe moving away from managing other people's money and going into your own. But in terms of the industry, what's getting you excited? What's maybe causing some nerves? And what are you curious about? I mean, obviously, you know, AI is 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 a thing, and um, and you know, we'll see where that leads. I personally, and again, from, from the podcast, um, one of the great quotes was uh, Paul Craven said that uh, he has some friends who are pretty high up in the chess world. A computer will beat a human most times, but a human with a computer will beat a computer more times than you would think. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's going to be t some type of symbiosis as opposed to AI is just going to take over the markets and, you know, that, that that's... It'll be a computer trading computer. We've already got that happening now, and you know that's that is an aspect of the business. I I don't fear that anytime soon I'm going to be redundant. And on that note, <laughs> um, thank you very much. Absolute pleasure joining us on on today. Pleasure. Great. It's now time to trade thoughts with our unique guest. Joao Paulo Pacifico. Definitely the first time I got that right. <laughs> um, Joao, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure for me to be here. Thank you for having me. Absolute pleasure. And just to give the listeners um, a bit of context, you are the founder and the CEO of the Gaia Group. You're also one of LinkedIn's top voices. And correct me if I'm wrong, but with over 600,000 followers on LinkedIn. 450,000. But yeah, <laughs> small numbers here. You've also written a few books. Um, you're on the board of Greenpeace uh, Brazil. Yeah. And you are a big advocate for impact investing as well as other endowments to help with the planet and sustainability and all this kind of thing. So an incredible CV. But I kind of want to start back with your company and maybe the history of your company and specifically how you transitioned from just having, you know, a, a company that was the idea was about making money and that side of things to a place that's more about impact on the planet, on the environment. Firstly, when did that decision happen and why did you make it? Great. I started the company in 2009 and uh, the motivation to start the company was, uh, I was a kind of uh, uncomfortable with the lack of humanity in the financial market. Everyone is just numbers, 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 numbers. And they forgot to see that there is a human being in the other side. The, the employee is, is a human. So I started Gaia uh, trying to have a company in which everyone could be happy working, even in the financial market. So I started to study positive psychology, happiness, purpose. How can I, we have an environment in which everyone can be happy? So this is completely different from the greedy financial market in which everyone just looks for money, for, for numbers. And then I started that in 2009. And then we created 10 values in the company. And the first value is practice gratitude and make others smile, be kind, celebrate. So it's a kind of different from the market. But we were doing the same of other companies. We are financing big real estate properties, the agriculture. But then um, in 2014, we opened our first NGO to help kids. So uh, to give education to poor people and it was a kind of a shift in our story. And then in 2014 also we became one of the first B Corps in Brazil. B Corps is, is a world movement uh, of companies that try to uh, make the world better. So in 2014. And then in 2016, I realized that, that I could use the instruments of the financial market to make the world better, to reduce the inequality to combat the climate change. So then we started to uh, use the instrument that I used just to, to finance big buildings to help poor people, to make the construction of people uh, for affordable housing. Um, and then we make a shift in 2016, 17. And then in 2022, I sold all of the parts of the group, Grupo Gaia, that were not related to impact investing. And I decided just to go with Impact Investment since last year, since 2022. And uh, right now we have an endowment fund and uh, we work to make the, better, the world better. And I'm very happy with this. It's incredible because 
I mean, hopefully this doesn't come across like offensive, but most people, when they start a company, the idea is money, 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 right? It's very rare to actually see someone transition into impact. Why? What? I, I, we can hear, we've heard about the story about what happened, but what was it inside of you that changed? I always had this vision to, to uh, happiness is something that is not alone. The happiness is uh, it's collective, it's uh, something cooperative. If you go to have a, you can have, you can be the richest person in the world. If you are alone, you are going to be unhappy. And we have many people that is very, very rich and is unhappy, taking a lot of pills and uh, depression and uh, with burnout and doesn't make any sense. So I also, I, I, of course, it's very important to have money. It's very important. With money, you can have a better life. You can give a better school for your kids. Uh, you can tr uh, travel around the world. But doesn't make sense for uh, if someone has a lot of money and you, you can see in Brazil people living in the streets. And for me, it uh, doesn't make any sense. I want to live in a world in which everyone can uh, have access to uh, health, education, housing. Doesn't make sense to look at, uh, at other people and don't realize that I could be this this person. And uh, I'm lucky that I have um, I live in a in a big city and uh, my parents are uh, middle class. And then uh, I, I I'm very successful in business really, but um, I'm not alone. And when you have something that I think is very important for everyone, which is compassion, and not in a religious way. Compassion is when you can see, that you have the empathy with other people and you, what we can do to alleviate the suffering of others in a, in a good way, because it's going to be good for me and good for them and good for the, the whole population. Uh, of course, if we go to, to big cities, you can have people uh, in the streets uh, starving. It's, it doesn't make any sense. In Brazil, we have 33 million people starving. And it's crazy. We cannot accept this. And the responsibility for this is not for the, those guys. It's impossible for someone that is starving, that is living on the streets, to go to be a middle class. It's impossible. But the people who has access to power and to money, we can make this change. And I have this kind of a responsibility. And I, I try to make my, my best to, to, change it, to, to change it. Wow. <laughs> I think that was arguably one of the most inspiring two minutes that we've yeah. actually had on this podcast since we started recording because i mean we talk about trading right yeah. this is part of what we do on the show and a massive element of trading is this idea of money and i think it's so important for us to have the right balance that to understand what money is what it can be used for and the actual impact that you can have and responsibility you have once you've earned it in the first place Definitely. And I wanted to start off by simply, could you explain to the audience, what is impact investing? Perfect, Poco. Yeah, impact investment is when you look to risk, return, and what is the impact of your investment. Because when you buy a company, when you buy a piece of a company, or when you're going to lend money to a company, this company can do something good for the world or bad for the world. Really, we have, we have companies that are producing fossil fuels. And we, we can see the climate change, which is huge. So when you are investing in a company that's going, doing bad for the world, uh, okay, you can make money, but what is the cost for the planet and for the people of your investments? So impact investment is not a donation. It's, an, it's, it's a responsible investment in which you are going to have direct impact in something. So I'm going to give some examples. We have financed smallholder farmers in the northeast of Brazil. Poor people that plant cocoa and uh, reforests. And in one year, the income of those guys increased around 38%. It's incredible because we are uh, make mo ma making money for us. It's, we have a, a positive return. And also we are helping the people to have a better life and also to protect the nature and to reforest. So this is the impact investing. When you look at those uh, other aspects of the investing, not just the graphs, which is important, oh, okay, but that, that it's, I'm going to make money, yes, but what's the cost for everyone? One thing that we see many times is that the companies and, and many investors uh, privatize the profit and socialize the loss. If you are damaging the environmental, if you are uh, creating some problems to climate change, then everyone's going to suffer and you're going to have the profit of it. 
how can we change it? So when we have an investor that uh, looks in other ways, you can make the world better. Yeah, no, that's really good because I think being able to invest, make money, but then also have that fulfillment of yourself knowing that your money has been put to good use and impacted someone else's life. I think that's definitely the best best way to go about things. Exactly. And the world's going to be better for everyone. I can give you an example. Brazil has 12% of the fresh water in the planet. Brazil has a huge agriculture, but uh, the level of use of p pesticides in Brazil is uh, more than huge. And we are contaminating the water of the planet. Uh, there are many pesticides that are, are not allowed here in Europe that are, are allowed in Brazil. And the, the same company that do doesn't sell this, this product here, so sell this product in Brazil. And investors are uh, financing this. So why not change to bio inputs in which we can have organic farming and a better water for everyone? So, but the financial market just look at the profit in the short term. Oh, I I'm gonna make a lot of money investing in pesticides and this kind of stuff. So I'm gonna do this. And what we try to do is we will not invest in pesticides. We are gonna invest in bio inputs to have a, a different farming. So this is a uh, another look in which you just you, you look to everyone, not just not just by uh, to ourselves. My my profit in the short term, which is the kind of a rule in the financial market. I want to play devil's advocate with you for a second. Please, please. Uh, I think the the number one question when it comes to impact investing, I think in the UK the term here is like ESG investing. I know that it's slightly different, but same overall kind of niche is that when it comes to investing. I want to just invest to make money. And when it comes to my impact, I want to use other areas of my life to do that, whether that's through volunteering or through giving charity. Why do I have to now implement that into the part of my life that's really focused on making money? Yeah, because it's everything is connected. If you're going to invest 100 and going to donate uh, one, in, uh, that is, the balance of what, of what we are doing is uh, a lot of negative. So... Uh, you cannot say, "Oh, I'm gonna do. Uh, I'm gonna invest. I'm gonna make a lot of money doing the world uh, worst, worst, and then making a uh, little money. I'm gonna donate to plants and trees. Uh, let, let's say we are gonna uh, uh, finance fossil fuels and plant ten trees. Oh, come on, doesn't make sense. It, it's just a greenwashing. And unfortunately, in the in Brazil, I can say, and even in the world, ESG, which is something important, ESG stands for Environmental, Social, and Governance. Uh, when you take uh, all of these aspects uh, in terms of your investment decision. It's good, but many people use the term ESG to make greenwashing. And greenwashing is this, okay, I'm going to invest something and I'm going to donate just a little portion of it to make uh, marketing. But we need to look, uh, because everyone is connected. Uh, I'm going to uh, give an example, which is pretty simple to understand. If I have employees, and I have employees with a very, very low salary. Of course, my, my profit is going to be higher. It's much simpler. Uh, we, we can see big companies that pay a little salary without any benefits and make more money. But th these guys, uh, I was seeing some companies that depend, that some employees of big companies that depends on benefits from the governments to survive. And doesn't make any sense. Someone's going to be a trillion dollars rich and there is a poor guy working to help this guy to be richer. I completely agree with everything you said. So now, if we're sitting here, me and Poku, being like, we're on board, we love it. Impact investing is the way forward. But we're concerned now because you said ESG. I'm sure there's a lot of it has good intention and is doing the right thing. But you said there's plenty of people who are taking advantage of the marketing ploy. How do we differentiate and how do we actually go about impact investing as an individual? Yeah. This is a problem because the system works in a way in which they just stimulate more profit without looking at this. And this, and the system is stimulate to have greenwashing. And this is very bad. The first thing I think uh, is to find companies, uh, banks or whatever that is really committed to change, committed to make the world better. We have some movements such as the B Corp movement, which is, a, I believe, is a, is a good movement in the world. There are some banks in Europe. Uh, such as Triodos in Holland or others uh, that are trying to do good things. And the, the point which is important is that uh, it's not a donation, it's an investment with return, a positive return. 
but a positive re return, as Poco said before, with uh, fulfillment. Mm -hmm. Because you're going to understand that you are what your actions is making the world better, is reducing the inequality, is helping someone, is helping the planet. And we are ha facing huge problems. Briefly, very briefly, because I know that a lot of listeners might have this question. Simple one, what, what is greenwashing? Greenwashing is um, when you have the more marketing than, than impact. You, you are going to uh, cut 100 trees, you're going to plant three trees, and you're going to take a, a, a photo. Oh, look here, I'm, go I'm doing the world better. Got it. So it's the, it's the fake marketing. When you, you, you fake that you're uh, doing something good, but okay, you can do some very small good, but in a whole, it's just marketing. So with the new year, a lot of people want to you know, start making their changes. Personally, I personally believe people should make changes when they feel like the time is right. But you know, new year resolution is here. So what would you advise people that are watching to then do differently when it comes to investing and for the world? Good question and important question. Everyone in the new year starts to say, I'm going to do more yoga. And may, many times, just something for themselves. How can we have a, uh, a look at, at everyone? How can we have actions to invest in a world that we believe? How can we invest in something that we can make the world better? Of course, helping you, but helping others. We need to understand that the happiness is not something individual. The happiness is for everyone. And how can we act in the... Uh, true terms in order to make the world better and spread this all everything that the people had uh, learned with us today how can they say it to others share these videos share this audio to make the world better and we need to understand that we have the responsibility powerful yeah i like that so you can have yoga on the list but add some other things for other people as well <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah of course of course we need to understand that it's very easy to say Oh, please, government, help the people, help the poor people. But uh, it's impossible. The private sector should take responsibility for everything. I, I cannot accept 33 million people starving in my country. What should I do? I'm financing the smallholder farmers. I'm donating. And uh, if everyone take a little action, we can make the world better. And even in investments. You mentioned briefly there again about people and how important that side of things is and right at the beginning of um, our conversation today you spoke about the policies that you incorporated when you started your business about making the environment for people a nice place to work somewhere they want to come back and a good environment and you said when, when did you start this 2009 yeah the company yeah. right so that was well before it's fashion i mean me and poker you probably see now companies like you know Apple and Amazon trying to make it more fun with benefits. I mean, everyone wants to be an Apple employee, right? Because you get slides at work and you get all these benefits and etc. But I'd love to hear more about what you were doing at your company and how you made or how you would tell other companies now to make it a better environment. I mean, there's a reason why you're one of the top voices on LinkedIn, because you spoke about these policies very early before it was fashionable. So what, what are you doing? Great. It's very important to have rituals in a company. Because, of course, you can say, oh, we are a nice company. You're going to make a book, put the uh, beautiful words in the, in the wall. But you need to have rituals in which everyone's going to be uh, feeling care by each other. So in Gaia, we have many, many rituals. For instance, we uh, try to uh, understand each person as a person, a different person. What is your problems in your life? How can we as a company help you? To, to be better in your life as a whole. What is your dreams? We, we try to understand the dreams of each employee and it's wonderful. Our record is 15,000 uh, applicants for one job in Gaia. It's crazy. It's crazy. Why? Because the people want to be happy. And it's so simple. It's so, so obvious that everyone want to be happy. And if you ha can have an environment of, of happiness, everyone is going to feel safe. The, the psychology of safety is very important for everyone. Uh, when someone makes a mistake, this person feels uh, comfortable in sharing the mistake with others or is going to hide it. It's very important because if this person hides the mistake, we can have a huge problem in the company. But in otherwise, if, the, if this person is safe to share with others, we can fix the problem very soon. And this, uh, I say that environmental of work is extremely important for the happiness. 
and just not say uh, have a, a a game, a football game or something. We need to have a environmental and how you treat each other. The caring with each other is extremely relevant for uh, well-being. In Brazil, one third of the employees are uh, have any kind of mental disorder. The levels of anxiety, depression, burnout is huge. So, of course, it's wrong. It doesn't need to be this like this. It doesn't make any sense to have a company that makes profit and and make the the life of his employees worse. What's the reason for this? Oh, okay, we have a huge profit, but we have many people that are uh, suffering. Oh, come on, we we can have a company. Of course, that is. Uh, financial feasible that makes money, but of course, make the people. I have one, one uh, objective, one goal is when someone goes to Gaia and works for months, years, decade. When this person leaves the company, I want this person is going to be a better person in terms of financial health, uh, happiness, uh, conscious understanding of the system. Well, it's wonderful. Because uh, we are going to uh, put a positive mark in this person, not a negative mark. That was really powerful. And for those that may be outside of your company, like me and Gabriel, or anyone watching, you know, private trader, private investor, how can we help on our side? How can we do our part as someone that just privately invests? I think we need to make something in UK, in Europe, to bring these ideas, to inspire other companies, to look at the world in a different way. To look at the world in a way in which we can make uh, the world better and uh, understanding that money is very important, but it's just one aspect of the life. We cannot forget the money. It's not, uh, okay, I'm going to live without any money. No, of course, we need to make money. We, to, we want to have a, a good life, but we want to have more things than just money. And how can, uh, and you guys that are uh, influencers, how can we inspire other companies, inspire brokers to see the world in a different view? And then I'm sure we can change the world. We can make the world, the, 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 the life of everyone better in Africa, in South America, in Asia, in Europe, in, in the US. I think that is such a powerful place for, for us to end today. Um, hopefully someone, like you said, all of us individually can make a difference. Hopefully someone listening, everyone sitting there watching is thinking to themselves, what can I individually do? It's not for the other person watching, it's actually for each person to take it upon themselves. And so I'm really hoping that you have, through your words, changed. I mean, I know that you've changed me in Poku, mm -hmm. um, but again, to everyone listening today, I hope you've done that as well for them. So thank you for coming on today and sharing. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm very happy to be here. You are very nice. <laughs> we try. <laughs> <laughs>
a little bit selfishly, but sometimes I just forget there are people listening and watching to us. And I'm just sat there like I'm learning. So, I mean, even you with your trading and all that kind of stuff, but like yeah, by the can... sounds of it, you'll just be getting better and better every single time. Yeah. No. Just stealing the information from these guys that are just letting it flow, right? Yeah, and it's, it's great to also network as well, because in what situation would I ever be able to get to meet these people? So again, having one of Ticknell's market strategists, it's great to have him on your side and you know, you know, what can go forward from there. A hundred percent. So like we said, what a great episode to start off 2024. It's only up from here, eh? So then who can I learn from in the next episode? We, we, we've oh. got, we've got listeners. Yeah. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Who can we learn from in the next show? Well, really interestingly, we're going to have Nick Leeson on. Now that name might not ring about to everyone, but he is an infamous trader. Uh, I'm fairly certain that he was responsible for one of the biggest financial crashes slash crises in the 20th century so we'll leave it there there's also a movie about him if you're interested you can do a little bit googling a bit of research if you're a t-show listener prior to the next episode the road trade though it's going to be fun can't wait anyways we'll see you next time on the t-show where it's, it's time, time to trade, trade thoughts, thoughts.